Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Jessica Clemens, and this is a breakdown of the third episode of Marvel's newest Disney Plus show, Echo. We last left off with Maya starting a new war of her own, showing everyone in New York the new boss in town while still ignoring her family and their wishes. In this episode, we're introducing the Black Knife Cartel, which might lead to their favorite enemy, Bullseye, who last we saw was getting a bionic freaking spine in the final season of Daredevil. We are slowly threading in the Netflix Daredevil and sneakily dropping little hints. There's so much to talk about, so let's just just jump right into it. But actually, first, before we jump right into it, don't forget to check out nerdriot.shop, where right now you can find merch inspired by the Echo series, including a shirt featuring the big man himself and a shirt with Echo spelled out in ASL with bloody knuckles. Grabbing a piece of merch from nerdriot.shop is a great way to support the channel. Now, let's get into it. We open this episode the same way we opened episode one, the same blue spiral underneath Earth. Scully tells Maya how their grandmother Chola could trace their roots to Chaffa. After the previously on, we jump to an old-timey title card. First is the Marvel Studios logo, which flickers like an old school film. Then it rolls to the Marvel Spotlight logo and the Spotlight font really works for this. They're setting up an old school movie Western vibe to frame the late 1800s, especially since this episode is centered around the Light Horsemen and their steeds and heroic feats. The next card gives us a border and now with the sun centered at the top, it says, in the late 1800s, Indian country was infested with dangerous criminals threatening the safety of the native nations. Tribes established their own police force to bring these criminals to justice. These tribal police were called the Light Horsemen. Then the sun at the top turns into the Choctaw National Seal. The Light Horsemen are actually a real thing. The principal chief had six, later nine, whom he appointed and who served as his special agents in carrying messages, making arrests, monitoring and banning whiskey, and assisting their government in enforcing the laws. They had Americans like coming in and people messing stuff up, so they had to have their own people outside of the law that could govern it. They're basically like their own police force. They're also called Light Horsemen because they had to travel so light, so they're always ready to go and could travel long distances. Choctaw Cherokee, Chickasaw, Seminole, and Creek all had light horsemen. These ones we're seeing right now are technically called the Asaba Aminili Tushka, meaning warrior who rides a horse, specifically the Choctaw horse. You just know the Foley artist had so much fun recreating this scene. You can hear the horse clops, but they're in the grass. It just sounds like a fake horse hoof on cement, and I love it. It is so easy to fall into a rut with food, but it's also so boring. My problem is that if it's left up to me, I'll eat the same boring stuff every single day like Zach Huddleston, which is exactly why I'm thrilled when instead of having to figure it out on my own, Cook Unity can do it for me. Cook Unity is the first chef to consumer platform that delivers freshly prepared pre-selected meals right to your door weekly. Cook Unity is basically a pipeline from your home to dozens of talented chefs that cook delicious, inventive meals fresh every day in regional micro kitchens, not warehouse production facilities. And the meals they make are updated weekly, so you can't get bored. You can pick from whopping 350 plus meals each week based on your dietary needs, including vegetarian, pescatarian, and keto, you know that's me. What kind of cuisine do you like? Or just, I don't know, give me chicken, I won't forget. Which could be the Esther Choi's teriyaki roasted salmon. Or if you're more in the mood for beef, you could have a Stacey Baring grilled Asian hanger steak with charred broccolini. Variety is the spice of life, and with Cook Unity, you can live a spicy life. Cook Unity's roster of all-star chefs include Food Network alums, James Beard award winners, and acclaimed restaurateurs. Balancing flavor and nutrition in the creations, there is seemingly endless variety of meals to choose from. The subscription is super flexible. You can pause, skip weeks, or cancel at any time, and it's super easy to do. Go to cookunity.com slash nrockstars50 or click the link in the description and use my code nrockstars50 to get 50% off your first order of Cook Unity meals to try them out for yourself. As they ride through the forested terrain, we see a small area of homes. Initially following the Trail of Tears, most of the people quickly built homes that were constructed like log cabins. And over the next few years, the logs would shrink or create gaps. So they didn't last long, but you'd see them sort of lean over time. And that's why the houses in the background sort of look like that. And then another title card. Then what I think is a squash being murked and up rises a small woman. This is Tuklo, played by Danny McCallum. One of Echo's ancestors we've seen with the wide brimmed hat. And just like, look here. The Light Horsemen were traveling across the entire Choctaw Nation at the time. And this is the 1800s. So it was different clothing for all different weathers, heavy coats, hats, what have you. They just had all all the gear prepared. The title card says her father was a light horseman, but Tuklo was a might force all on her own. At the top of the frame is the sap sucker that we keep seeing. We see it again later on another title card, and this must be a message from her ancestors or possibly a warning, but I think it's the beginning of something new to come and they're preparing her. Then her dad hands her a rabbit stick, a weapon for early Choctaw hunters. Carved from hickory limb, it is commonly used to kill rabbits or small animals. With the next title card, we see her mission is just to be a light horseman, just like her father. It's like Maya following in her father's footsteps, though this one is 
isn't working for Fisk. He tells her, no, women are life givers, men are life takers. The system was made up of a matriarchal society. Like the foundation of that society is the women. They can birth and create new life, literally physically create new life, but also with agriculture. And then the men just kill to protect, eat, and you know, some say to survive. Too close says it best though, to give life means nothing if I cannot protect it. She storms off on horseback to a creek. This creek does resemble the creek west of the Nanawaye cave in Mississippi. It's surrounded by woods and since it's part of the Choctaw creation story, wouldn't make sense for how the ancestors are reaching too close through their waters. She braids her hair knowing it's for Choctaw warriors, for Choctaw men, and they will see her for who she is. It was common in Choctaw traditional hair, men wear their hair long enough to make two braids. And I also love that we often see Maya with two braids or at least one. Hopefully that means she's a warrior. The Light Horsemen are in action until it's a trap. A shootout commences when the title card says, meanwhile, too close senses something. The frame no longer gives the Choctaw seal or the sun, but the sap sucker again. Back at the creek, too close senses something. Then she sees the spiral symbol and like Echo, we see in the sky her eyes. In a sequence, we see Chaffa, then Loak from the last episode. She disappears in the blink of an eye like we saw Maya's mom do in the kitchen. Then we cut to Chaffa staring at her hands, puzzled. We see the first of the Choctaw people under the earth. Then back to Loak playing stickball from the last episode. The spiral beams brighter and then Tuklo lifts her head concerned. We're back at the shootout and here comes Tuklo hitting every single mark. Her father releases a war cry, impressed and proud by the looks of it. So we now know through Tuklo, Maya will harness supreme accuracy. Then we cut to the intro, that's my newfound addiction. Chola is pissed and buzzing at the gate of the security cam. You can see the Oklahoman, the daily newspaper in Oklahoma. She yells Yakoki when buzzed in, which means thank you. She's fed up when she enters Scully's pawn shop and grandpa over here is just trying to get laid and I really, I love Scully. I think he's one of my favorite kids characters now. His shirt says the natives, a play off the Beatles and their Abbey Road album cover. Jokes aside, they're not together anymore and that actually makes me sad and I wonder if it's because of Maya's mother's passing that they just split up at the end. Scully responds to her saying halito, which means hello in Choctaw. We see a sign when Chola is seated that says payday loans, we buy gift cards, check cashing. So truly Scully does all, he's a jack of all trades. Also, I'm sorry, but Chola is me when he sits next to her and she tells him to go sit over there. I think I do that to literally anybody that gets too close to me. I also love that Biscuit damn near totaled her truck and is only getting $100 back from the pawn shop. Like that will do anything. Also that hat behind Scully says, young at heart, slightly older in other places. And what's not to love about him? And okay, I'll stop pointing out the ridiculous things. Fine, I just love this little pawn shop. Then we cut to Vicky snitching out Maya's location like we all knew would happen. And he's on the phone with the crazy bald guy from the last episode. His name is Zane, played by Andrew Howard, who played Luther Banks in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. We thought this could be Theodore Zarco from the comics who ran the Black Knife Cartel and was up against Bullseye. And I still believe it's him. The rumor online is that his name is Theo Zane and he runs the cartel alongside someone else. Also later you can see the double source tattooed on his goons. In the comics they had it tattooed on their foreheads. So we might be expecting an appearance from our favorite madman. And from our favorite madman I mean Bullseye. Look I just want to see him in the suit. He is a crazy person. I get it. He's had a hard life. I'm not trying to excuse his actions because he definitely drives in a car with a woman that's dead in the passenger seat. I think about that like once a day. We got Amaya down by a lake. When she turns she's faced with Chaffa who shifts between herself and the people they were before emerging. When Maya takes a deep breath, visions of the sapsucker leaving their hand and flying to the post the night of Maya's mom dying, to Tuklo and Maya's dead mother, back to Tuklo braiding her hair in the forest near the creek running calmly. Tuklo then removes the belt from her father's hat, a woman squeezing droplets of water onto a pregnant belly. This is a woman we saw in the snippet of what's to come in the first episode. We then get low beams of light like you're in a stretcher moving through a hospital. Tuklo screams something urgent like a warning and then Maya's drugged. We start noting that when she's clearly in danger or beside herself, the visions of her ancestors ease her or just warn her. So we saw Maya's oldest ancestor, the first to enter the passage, relay their message through the sapsucker, and it looks like they're all entangled by the spiral link. It was revealed by Can We Get Some Toast that, uh, and spoilers. So Can We Get Some Toast said that Maya's powers will not be the same as the ones in the comics. Still, she'll be empowered by her ancestors when threatened, and that so far is looking to be true, not only with Maya, but with Tuklo and Loak as well. This character did copy many other characters in the comics, and if you want to make a story that gives her a different link, then I think this is a better one and I like it. It's giving me like a heartfelt Shazam. Maya awakens as the new disco ball in Henry's skating rink, frees herself by wiggling out of her prosthetic. Then it's silent and in walks Vicky and two women. Vicky and Gracie both have the same little cat tattoo and I could not confirm where it comes from. If you know, let me know. It's kind of heinous. They've already tied up Henry and now they've tied Maya to an exercise machine. This skating rink is just wild. It's like a half gym, half skating rink. Later we see it has like laser tag. It just got too 
much stuff. Bonnie then shows up at the skating rink. Little does she know it's under siege. She goes around back and runs into Henry. He signs, leave now, go. Thankfully, she picks up what he's putting down. Then, just when you think Bonnie made it, she gets yanked up, tied down, and thrown in with Maya, who's been avoiding her this entire time. This moment is also just so heartbreaking. Y'all are adults, just share your feelings. And I know they can't right now because they're restrained, but soon they can just sign to each other how they love each other. Maya scoots her spring-loaded boot knife and cuts herself free, then frees Bonnie. Clever girl. Bonnie confronts Maya about never returning her calls or emails for years, and Maya is unfazed. Bonnie's chewing her out, and Maya's just sitting there like, Anne, what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> I got I kind of like it about her. When Vicky and his goons walk into Maya and Bonnie's holding area, they walk over a red circle with a black dot and a target. And I'm sorry. Still, if this isn't foreshadowing for Bullseye, specifically in the Colombian connection with Teodoro Zorro and the rest of the Black Knife cartel from the comic book, I don't know what it is, but I think he's coming. There's still a possibility that Henry doesn't necessarily work for Fisk. He could be like three degrees off from Fisk. So what if his dealings were with the Black Knife cartel at the beginning? This would make sense also to why Zay knew Henry and approach them like they're old friends. And I bet Henry is hiding the Black Knife Cartel tattoo under his wristband. I don't think it's off. I think that's something we should think about. I think he works for someone that's just not necessarily Fisk. Once Bridget points a gun at Bonnie, the sound and music fade. We hear Echo's low heartbeat. She's calmer than usual, probably because she's not restrained and knows she can kick everybody's asses. Then Maya punches the hell out of Bonnie with absolutely no warning, zero warning. Her warning was the sucker punch. Though they take Bonnie, I'm sure they also have a plan. Then here comes Zane. He also didn't bring the money because he had to assess the situation first and didn't want to get double crossed, which makes sense and Vicky's an idiot. Maya begins MacGyvering a BB gun with a roller skate and some bolts while Bridge is watching a video tutorial on holding a hostage. It's credited as Militia Mommy Podcaster and the name is credited as Shelby Hall. Right when the video says to protect yourself, Maya shoots out the lights with a makeshift electric BB gun. Then this dummy walks into the dim lit trap and gets beat the hell out of. And it feels just like Netflix's Daredevil when he turned off those lights and just beat everyone's asses. Then exactly what happens to Vicky happens. So now there's no bounty and a dead Vicky. Then the lights turn freaking red. And again, doesn't this remind you of like every daredevil fight scene with the contrasting lights? And also, yeah, Rob Zombie's Dracula plays. And of course it does, because why wouldn't it? Henry leads the goons to the breaker that's at the laser tag area of the skate rink. And this man literally gets blasted with electricity and stops the music for a second. Henry laughs and abruptly gets punched in the face. And this is the second sucker punch of the evening. And I, I love it. And then the music starts again. Honestly, this was a great sequence. Then here comes Maya beating all that ass in the dark. It's a real, don't get it twisted. I'm not stuck in here with you. You're stuck in here with me moment. It's so good. Then we see the scene we've got from the trailer of Maya falling through the Make America Skate Again wall. When she lands on the man, she palms his head and smashes it into the rink and blood splatters out. And this is just metal as hell. She then channels Tuklo and aims that gun at a goon hitting his hand and picks up another goon's gun. The precision of Tuklo is out. When she kicks this man in the face, his blood splatters onto the disco ball. She hits the goons directly in the head, killing all of them. Then we start to only hear her heartbeat again. She's still channeling Tuklo though. The sound comes back after flipping this man on his ass. She gets tossed into a pinball game machine called The Legend of the Coyote. The choreography here is just very fun. It's very fun, it's very good. And like Daredevil, it's like six minutes long. She then kicks this man standing on top of an air hockey table. What was he planning on doing, pile driving? My second favorite gruesome kill is Maya getting bullets through this guy. It's remarkable. Other than a movie, Quick and the Undead is also a board game about out laws and you're the leader and you need to control the West Fort by killing the undead plague. It's also a game where Maya lasso whips the shit out of everyone in sight. Channeling Tuklo again, like when using the rabbit stick, Maya starts tossing ski balls at everyone. And I'm also just still more astonished there's so much to do at this skating rink because mine sucked as a child. Regardless, they got Henry and Maya tied kneeling again because they captured Bonnie and Maya wasn't ready to risk that. Then right as he's about to kill Henry, Zane's phone rings and it's New York Minute by the Eagles. I love that Zane has chosen this song as Wilson Fisk's ringtone and the lyrics really match what's happening here. In a New York minute, everything can change. And oh boy, do they. When he answered the phone flustered, it was clear that the man he was talking to had bigger plans and they let Bonnie, Henry, and Maya leave. Zane is a little irritated with it and just like in the comics, he's sort of hot-headed and crazy so nothing good will come of this. Then the Black Knife Cartel just leaves, like that. Bonnie and Maya step outside and Maya finally apologizes for punching Bonnie square in the face. Luckily, Maya promises no one will hurt Bonnie. She wouldn't let that happen, though she did just punch her in the face and I'm never gonna let her live that down. Then Bonnie takes off believing Maya. So now we know Bonnie will eventually maybe get kidnapped again or her hurt and Maya will have to step in the way. This is why Peter wears a mask so no one in his family can get hurt. 
even though they all got hurt. Back at Henry's office, he's upset and shaken. For some reason, it's clear to everyone but Maya that Kingpin saved her. However, Henry still decides to fight with her. Then when we remain by Samantha Crane plays and we get these gorgeous overhead shots of Oklahoma, Maya's little house resembles too close small village town being surrounded by trees and away from everyone else. Scully arrives with a gift. It's the prosthetic leg guard. It's gold with a classic traditional Choctaw design and a sun at the top. He says it's for the Choctaw warrior. Then he lectures Maya on seeing her grandma and it just looks like these two will never talk unless one is dying or one's almost dead. They just refuse to talk to each other. Echo goes out on her bike and we see scenes of everyone down in the dumps. Bonnie at a bar, Chola at church, not even singing. Biscuit is getting down in the back singing. Then we see Wilson Fisk off the IV drip and doing something nervous and weird with his hands. His eye is still bandaged and he's clearly blind in it, but he's shown his face finally. We assume he's called off the hit on Maya, but we don't actually know. What we do know is this is the beginning of his wild ass coming in. We still haven't seen that moment in the trailer where he agrees to go to war with Maya. And that's it for my breakdown of the third episode of Echo. Tune in tomorrow for episode four's breakdown and follow me on Instagram, Twitter at Lulu underscore Clemens. Follow New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Check out The Break Room where we'll be covering Echo and all everything else you want. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.